Um, and now formally on behalf of the American Sephardi Federation Institute of Jewish Experience and the Rabbi Arthur Schneier International Program of Yeshiva University. We are very happy to host our New Works Wednesday here with the crew, crew from Jamaica. And I will allow them to introduce themselves and Professor Perales will introduce them as well. Um, because as you see, we have a nice panel here. It's a little bit of a different take on how we're gonna do it today. So I'm excited to hear this. and. Uh, just putting it out there that we've been throwing around this idea about a trip to the Caribbean with Jewish Caribbean. I just, I, I'm very into this and I know Professor Perellis is as well. So send us some emails, encouragement if you're gonna, uh, if you're thinking of joining us there as well. Um, and with that, I will hand over the floor to Professor Perellis. Thank you, Drora. Uh, it's it's uh, wonderful to, to gather today. Um, this is very exciting and I don't want to take away time. I want to give just a, a brief introduction uh, um, to everybody and, and welcome everybody here. And I, I just, as always, want to thank uh, ASF and uh, Dr. Jora Rusi of the Institute for Jewish Experience uh, for keeping keeping this alive, keeping this going, connecting people from all over the world. We have people connecting from so many different places um, and, and allowing for a really varied, um, vibrant view of, of the Jewish past and the Jewish present and, and the Jewish future in, in all these amazing places. Um, it, it is more important how we live than how we die, but how we remember those we have lost, how we memorialize their life is an essential mark of our humanity. All of us, I'm sure, are continuing to absorb the devastating news of the murders of the innocent children and the heroic teachers yesterday in Uvalde, Texas. Let us remember them as we spend an hour together hearing about the important noble work of our panelists today. They have spent years studying and preserving the legacy of Jamaica's Jews through the story of their cemeteries. The rabbis call the work of caring for the dead Chesed Shalemet, true kindness, or kindness of truth. It is a kindness done to someone who can never repay you, and thus its motive is honest and pure. However, as we will see today, that by caring about the dead, we can gain much in insight about their lives and the vibrant communities they formed in the not so distant past. And with that, I want to, I'm not going to introduce every single panelist, I'm going to leave that to um, uh, Rachel Frankel. Uh, who will be our first panelist. And Rachel Frankel is a principal of the firm Rachel Frankel Architecture in New York City. She's a co-author with Aviva ben Or of Remnant Stones, the Jewish Cemeteries of Suriname, and leads the effort to document Jamaica's Jewish cemeteries. And I first met Rachel through her writing on the cemeteries of, of the Caribbean, the Jewish cemeteries of the Caribbean in Suriname and, and Jamaica. And I got a chance to meet her at, at, some, at some good conferences. And I'm really excited to learn from her today and from this amazing crew you have assembled. And uh, really, it's a real honor. So thank you for joining us. And thank you uh, for all. And remember to put it, send your questions. Um, and we will have time for that uh, at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ronnie. And thank you to the American Sephardi Federation for this opportunity. The new work that we are delighted to present today is an online searchable database of Jamaica's Jewish cemeteries, whose history reaches back to 1661, when the English crown offered 30 acres to those who would settle in Jamaica. At that time, along with 30 acres, settlers offspring born in Jamaica received all the rights and privileges of Englishmen. Jews, overwhelmingly Spanish Portuguese qualified, and they came. But rather than establishing plantations and cultivating sugar, most took up residence in Port Royal and involved themselves in commerce. The narrow peninsula's high water table did not favor burial, and so mourners rode their dead across the harbor to bury them on higher ground at what would become known as the Hunts Bay Cemetery. It is the oldest known denominational cemetery in Jamaica with over 300 extant graves. The earliest dates to 1672. I hope you can all see um, my screen. Yes. Uh, this is um, a map 
uh, it's, um, it's the map. Uh, it was created in the 1950s by Claude de Souza. It's published in Jews of Jamaica, and it shows the main towns in which Jews settled. I'm going to leave that up while I speak. After the calamitous earthquake of 1692 destroyed much of Port Royal, many Jews relocated across the harbor to the emerging commercial capital of Kingston. You can see most of these places I'm speaking about on the map. Soon Jews also resided in Spanish town, the seat of government, and in many of Jamaica's small seaport towns. By the early 1700s, about 80 Jewish families resided in Jamaica. By 1730, their numbers had climbed to nearly 1,000. And by 1800, Jewish cemeteries ring the island, as you see. In both Kingston and Spanish Town, the Portuguese and the English German Jews established separate congregations and cemeteries. Today, Jamaica is the final resting place for, by my count, my count, roughly 10,000 Jews. The one cemetery that remains open for burial is roughly three acres in size, located in the heart of Kingston and is today referred to as the Orange Street Cemetery. The United Congregation of Israelites, Jamaica, maintains the cemetery, which is approaching its 200th years. And now I'm going to share an image, a drone image of that. I want you to please note that north is not directly up. North is a little up and to the left. Um, but for simplicity, I'm going to present it as such. Kingston's first Spanish Portuguese cemetery, not the one you're looking at, referred to as the North Street Cemetery, was in the old downtown area of the city, south of the Orange Street Cemetery that you're looking at. It is the final resting place for congregants of the Spanish and Portuguese Kahal Kadish Shahar Ha Shamavim, Holy Congregation Gates of Heaven, KKSA. The cemetery was approximately two acres in size. The fledgling congregation acquired it in 1714. In 1880, after roughly eight generations of internments, it closed for burial. In 1913, the graves were leveled. In other words, their brick bases were removed and the tombstones placed in position on the ground. In 1950, the site was sold to a commercial entity. At that time, approximately 100 grave markers were moved to the perimeter of the Orange Street Cemetery, and you can sort of see that on the top and the right-hand side of the image before you, and 68 markers were relocated to the Memorial Garden at the synagogue on Duke Street in Kingston. By the early 19th century, KKSA, must have figured that their cemetery would soon be full. After all, it held a century of burials of Kingston's Spanish Portuguese faithful. In 1822, exactly 200 years ago, the congregation purchased roughly one and a half acres of land a few blocks north, which would eventually become a part of today's South Street, um, today's Orange Street Cemetery. Let, let me pause here to note that there exists in the Jewish tradition an avoidance of adding land to a cemetery. It may have been for this reason, or many others, that the North Street Cemetery was not enlarged to accommodate future generations. While we have no record of the burial pattern at the North Street Cemetery, at the extant new cemetery ground that you're looking at, Burials are clearly organized in north-south rows, beginning, and if you can see my cursor, in the southwest corner. Burials of children, and I think of what Ronnie said before about what happened yesterday in Texas. Um, burials of children were also arranged in rows, starting in the southeast corner. 
For roughly 60 years, the two cemeteries coexisted. And I wonder how the congregation decided who would be buried in which cemetery, the Orange Street Cemetery or the North Street Cemetery. Parallel to the Spanish Portuguese, English German Jews established themselves in Kingston. In addition to building a synagogue, they purchased land for a cemetery. And at some point, they purchased another parcel across the street from the first one. By the time of the Great Fire in Kingston of 1882, which burned both the English German and the Spanish Portuguese synagogue buildings, the Jewish population had begun to dwindle. And after those losses, the Spanish Portuguese and English German congregations merged, forming a new congregation, which they would call the Kahil Kadosh Shahar HaShalom, Holy Congregation, Gates of Peace, KKSS, also known as the Amalgamated Congregation. Upon doing so, the newly amalgamated congregation purchased a parcel of land for a cemetery. The parcel, roughly one and a half acres in size, was adjacent to the, to, to the cemetery of the former Spanish-Portuguese KKSA congregation, which became known as the Old Ground. So this, with my cursor, was that one and a half acres purchased by KKSS, excuse me, SA, and then this one and a half acres was purchased by KKSS, the amalgamated congregation. Okay, um, and this would be referred to as old ground, and this would be referred to as new ground. Not to be confused with the North Street Cemetery, which by this time had been closed for burial for a couple of years, maybe two years. The parcel newly purchased by the amalgamated congregation, as I said, was referred to as the new ground, and by 1833, burials began. Starting in the northwest corner, also in North South Rose. Considering that congregational life in Jamaica, like many other places, was not always harmonious, it's not surprising that some KKSA congregants resisted joining the new amalgamated congregation. Yet their cemetery, the old ground, was filling up, leaving them with few empty plots for burial. So they brokered a deal with the amalgamated congregation whereby the lower third, this lower third of the new ground would be for them. So by the turn of the century, there were two separate yet adjacent cemeteries, one belonging to the Spanish Portuguese and filling up fast, and the other belonging to the amalgamated congregation with its lower third reserved for use by the Sephardim. By 1921, about 100 years ago, almost 40 years, after almost 40 years, the old holdout Spanish Portuguese congregation closed its doors and joined the amalgamated congregation, which formerly at that time changed its name to the United Congregation of Israelites, as it is still known. Today, about 15 feet of wall, right about here, that, once, uh, that likely once separated the two cemeteries remains. My hunch is that the, uni that the newly united congregation removed most of the wall. In other words, that there was probably once a wall that ran the whole width but left the fragment as a testament to their history, or perhaps there's a halakhic reason for, for leaving a fragment. I have yet to discern the boundary of that one third of the new ground reserved for the Spanish Portuguese congregation. Perhaps burials adhered strictly to it, perhaps not. Perhaps Spanish Portuguese congregants would rather have been squeezed into the old ground than be buried in the portions reserved in the new ground. Judaism has two main customs regarding burial, uh, burial orientation. One points feet toward the cemetery gate, 
which the cemetery gate, by the way, today is right here, and the other toward the land of Israel. Both customs indicate a belief in resurrection. The latter reflects a belief in the primacy of the land of Israel. At the Orange Street Cemetery, all the thousands of monuments spanning 200 years point southeast in the direction of the cemetery gate. The tombstones at Orange Street notably do not point to the land of Israel. Around 1961, Philip Wright and his anonymous photographer visited the Orange Street Cemetery and every other Jewish cemetery in Jamaica that Philip could find. Philip transcribed the Spanish, Portuguese, and English epitaphs. The Hebrew he left to the photographer to capture, which Charles Barnett in England then transcribed. Philip coupled this field work with research at the Institute of Jamaica and used Jacob Andrade's Record of the Jews in Jamaica, published in 1940. Philip Wright and Charles Barnett's work was published after their deaths in 1997 by the Bensvi Institute. The work is titled Jews of Jamaica, Tombstone Inscriptions 1663 to 1880. It is the magnum opus upon uh, um, on, on which our work builds. The publication is available online thanks to the University of Florida Digital Library of the Caribbean. Fast forward 1998. It was upon the steps of the John Carter Brown Library on the campus of Brown University where I met Ainsley Cohn Enriquez then president of the United Congregation of Israelites, Jamaica, and chair of the Jamaican National Heritage Trust. We were at the JCB Library for the seminal conference, Jews and the Expansion of Europe to the West. Ainsley, now my longtime close colleague and treasured friend, to whom I have never succeeded in refusing, asked, would I come to Jamaica and do for the Jamaican cemeteries what we had done in Suriname. Jamaica is, as Ainsley would say, a different story. And while the effort to do for Jamaica's Jewish cemeteries, that is to say, one, document them, two, bring them to public awareness, three, preserve and maintain them, and lastly, four, make them physically accessible to the public is not yet complete, we're on our way. Before I introduce my colleagues who will show you our new searchable online database and take you on brief tours of the Falmouth and the Orange Street cemeteries, I'll tell you a little bit more about our work in the cemeteries. For well over a decade, at the invitation of and under the auspices of the United Congregation of Israelites, I recruited participants to document Jamaica's Jewish cemeteries. CVE Caribbean Volunteer Expeditions provided the organizational structure for recruiting and registering overseas, mostly American volunteers. Individuals from Kingston's United Congregation of Israelites and other Jamaican institutions also volunteered. For each cemetery, we created the following documentation. Scaled site survey map enumerating each grave marker, digital and 35 millimeter black and white film photography of each grave marker, a transcription and English translation of each epitaph, and a description of the architecture and condition of each grave marker. Every year for a week or so, the group would work in one or two of the cemeteries and learn about Jamaican Jewry. And I'll share a photograph from 19... Let's see, bear with me a minute. This photograph is from, oops, bear with me. There we go. This group uh, is the group that volunteered in 2017. Um, some, some, some are on the panel today. 
Uh, once the documentation was well underway, it was time to bring it to public awareness. For many reasons, a published book would not do. So I sought an online digital platform. My first attempts were with academically affiliated libraries, but with them, our data was problematic. Gravestone markers needed to be linked to their respective photos. Photos needed to be synced with epitaphic names. Dates needed to be linked to conservation condition surveys. And maps needed to be interactive with all the data. Our materials weren't just files needing to be renamed, grouped, and scanned. Around this time, some of our volunteers who participated year after year and some who have ancestors buried in the cemeteries advocated for fundraising toward preservation and maintenance. And so in 2017, the nonprofit JJCPF, Jamaican Jewish Cemeteries Preservation Fund, came into being. At about this time, one of our especially dedicated volunteers, Diane Lyon-Weed, who's on our panel today, uh, she is a Jamaican Jewess residing in, residing in Florida. Diane discovered Semify, a software that she's going to soon explain. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce my close colleague and friend, Marina Delfos Harris, who holds a Master in Heritage Management and is the founder of Falmouth Heritage Walks. She maintains and gives tours of the Falmouth Jewish Cemetery on behalf of Jamaica's United Congregation of Israelites. In addition to being the creator of Jewish Jamaican Journeys Facebook uh, group page, Marina is a JJCPF board member and is experienced researching the Jewish records at the Jamaica Archives. Marina will now take you on the tour of the Falmouth Jewish Cemetery. Thanks, Marina. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel, stop sharing, please. Yep. Great. So I'm going to start a video, but be aware that the, the beginning of it, the volume is low. So please adjust your volume up. And when she enters the, um, the cemetery, the volume is normalized. Here it goes. Marina. Hey, I'm Marina Delfos Harris, a director of JJCPF and caretaker of the Falmouth Jewish Cemetery for the last 11 years. The cemetery is located in the historic town of Falmouth on Jamaica's North Coast. <coughs> and the, its existence has been oblivious to the residents and visitors to the town because of the nondescript stone walls and wooden gate. However, that changed in 2017 with the building, rebuilding of the Matter House and the erection of the storyboard. So welcome, and let's take a look inside. It's a relatively small cemetery. There are only 113 grave sites with 76 graves with markers. The oldest legible tombstone is right here from 1822, belonging to Lazarus Solomon's Esquire. His will actually states that there's no S at the end of his name. And we're not quite certain why his grave is pointing in a totally different direction from the rest of the graves in the cemetery. What makes Falmouth interesting, it is a mixed burial ground. It's mainly Sephardic names here, but there are also three Ashkenazi family names and five English names of origin. Assimilation was clearly taking place. There's no Spanish or Portuguese on the tombstones. There's very little Hebrew, only 13 tombstones have Hebrew on it. And there's no Hebrew observed after 1890. There were a number of children um, who died quite young during the 1850s, which was the time of the Asiatic cholera epidemic. 
So we have two little ones from the Delissa family out of the three children. They all died within a month of each other. And we also have three from the Nunes family, three little ones dying in succession of each other. And here are the three right there. Over the years, we've learned a lot about the persons buried in this cemetery. We start our tours right here with Abigail, underneath this magnificent ackee tree, which is the national fruit of Jamaica. Now, Abigail is the daughter of Alexander Lindo, a merchant and slave trader. She was one of 22 children from his two wives. This Lindo family plot contains the graves of Luna Lindo and three of her children. They moved to various places throughout the years, from Jamaica to the Channel Islands, back to Jamaica, to Cincinnati when opportunities opened there, back to Jamaica when Luna's husband passed, and then they remained in Canada for the rest of their lives. We point out the grave of Isaac Simon Esquire as his son, Sir John Simon, rose to prominence as the first Jew to practice common law bar in England and was appointed Queen's Council, elected several times to the British Parliament, and was knighted in 1886. This is where his father lies. The last tombstone that we'll show today is that of Dr. Lewis Ashnang. He's the first of his family to come to the island from Edinburgh, Scotland. He was the first Scottish-born Jew to graduate in medicine from a Scottish university. He was co-founder of the journal First Fruits of the West. He contributed regularly to the Occident and American Jewish Advocate, and he was a Freemason and served as master of the Friendly Lodge in Montego Bay. Of it, his great-grandson was Jamaica's first ambassador to the U.S. and presented his credentials to JFK in 1962. Let's make our way over to the Matter House, where I'll give you a peek inside and introduce you to the two persons from the community that are integral to the upkeep and access to the cemetery. Allow me to introduce you to Godfrey Lawson, popularly known as Baga. Without him, we couldn't keep up the maintenance of this cemetery. He is critical to it. Say hi, Baga. <laughs> also, allow me to introduce you to Sanya Hall, a certified mm. tour guide for many years and the person that conducts tours when I'm not available. She is well versed on the information we have compiled over the years and enjoys meeting the variety of individuals that visit this cemetery. Hi, Sanya. Hi, Miss Marina. Is there anything you'd like to, like to share with us? Certainly. So personally for me, I did not know that the Jewish Cemetery existed until I started doing this tour. And so I found it fascinating. And it is also the Jewish community, it is one of the longest continuous community here in Jamaica, having formalized themselves after the British took over in 1655. Before we leave, let me give you a quick tour of the Matter House. It basically serves as a heritage center similar to the one beside the synagogue in Kingston. We replicated eight of the storyboards so that we could provide extra information for visitors here to the cemetery. There's other additions that we'd like to do, but that hasn't happened yet. We also got visitors to write their feelings down when they came here. So much more to do, but the cemetery serves as an example of what can be done with other Jewish cemeteries on the island. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And uh, next, I'm happy to introduce Diane Lyon-Weed. Diane is a partner and vice president of Intergraph Corporation, a Florida-based family business exporting publishing services and products to the Caribbean. She is a founding member of JJCPF, currently serving as treasurer, all the while researching her Jamaican ancestry.
Over to you, Diane. Thank you, Rachel. Sorry about that. So I will start uh, sharing my screen, not with this picture. Sorry about that. Can everybody see that? Yes. A map of Jamaica. Okay. So um, Rachel has explained um, how we um, did, how we gathered and uh, was preparing documentation from around Jamaica year after year. We've made a Google map with some of the sites that we visited and some that we are yet to visit. Anyway, after the several years, as Rachel mentioned, we were trying to decide options of where to store our material and, um, and be able to put it up online. So we found this uh, software called Semify. Um, it was uh, developed by the Habing family of California. They are owners of a funeral home and cemetery, and they designed this software primarily for the purpose of managing currently operating cemeteries. However, what we loved about it is that it um, was that you it was based on on a, a site map, an interactive site map, there which you could link photographs, forms, documents, wills, anything else that you wanted to link to them. And, and the viewers could click on that and be able to research it. So we decided that it might be a good fit for us and we'd give it a, a, a try. So now I'm just going to review how um, CVE collected the data that we are put up on Semify. Uh, this is a picture on the left of Orange Street, which you've seen from, from uh, Rachel's uh, aerial shot. And on the right, you see us in the Matar house preparing to go out in the field. There's Joe sitting down there with a clipboard and a paper form on which we are going to record the information in the field. And Rachel's on the right there giving a volunteer instructions of what needs to be done. When we go out in the field, and now we've, this is in Falmouth, which you just saw in Marina's um, video, um, each grave is measured and, um, the, and the, uh, we work in pairs and the other person writes the information on the form. This is a typical looking form. We write, if, if there's an inscription, we write down the name and all the information that is visible. And on the second page, uh, we may even do a drawing if, if there's uh, information to be put down. Then uh, a photograph is made of each grave row by row. And as Rachel just said, they're done in black and white for archival purposes and also a color digital copy. Here's a typical, this is for also from Falmouth, a typical photo of what you're going to see up in Semify once we get it organized and numbered and into the map. We even take photos of fragments or plot, empty plots. In addition, measurements have to be taken of the entire cemetery for, um, and coordinates for actually drawing the maps, which are drawn by um, our architectural colleagues in CAD software. This drawing is of Hunts Bay and it shows, um, I think, I think Rachel said over 300 graves. I think it's like 330. In addition to that, we have to put all of the information taken on those paper forms now has to be entered onto databases, which are then uploaded to Semify and overlaid onto using the, the, the drawing you just saw, um, overlaid onto a satellite image of the, of the site with the individual information about each grave. You'll see on the, on the left is one of Isaac de Lucena. Now, uh, Joe is gonna show more detail of how he researched one of his ancestors using the Semify platform. So I won't go into that right now. This is a sneak peek 
of the Falmouth Jewish Cemetery, which we've just had uh, overlaid and all the information we put in, um, hopefully for you to be able to view in the next couple of months. So now I'm going to switch over and show you how, how you use it. I'm gonna stop this one. Finish it, and then we're going to go here. Okay, so in order to um, to go to Semify and to research the cemeteries that we've already put up online, you go to the JJCPF website and jjcpf.org, and you click on Cemetery Database. Joe will go over this. He's going to go to Hunts Bay. I'm going to show you a very small cemetery that we already have up online called Lacovia. When you click on that, you're going to get to a landing or splash page with some photos and, and uh, information about that cemetery or burial ground. And then you go to the top right hand, to the top bar, and you click on graveside, graveside lookup. Uh, we're gonna take as an example, um, this is a, a very small burial ground of only seven graves. And we're going to click on one, which is Rachel Lindo. On the left panel, then you will see a photograph of that grave, or maybe multiple ones. You can click through them by the right arrow or left arrow. And then you go down and you see uh, information about the grave, including the materials, if we know it, the type of marker, and so forth, and, and also family relationships, if we know them. In addition, at the bottom, you can see you, the documents that we have uploaded. This, the first one being that paper survey form with the information, including second page with the Hebrew transcription. And then you go to um, the, we have uh, the Hebrew in script transcription and translation done for us by Sam Pechikowski. And finally, there would be the English translation from Portuguese, which was done for us by Judith Berlowitz. Now that's the information we have about that particular tomb, but we also have other information about materials and shapes and so forth, which we are adding little by little with the help, with the help of, um, of um, Mary Jablonski, which she's gonna talk about in a little while. Um, and that's it for now. We hope to add in the future additional search uh, elements, but um, right now you can only look people up by name. And um, if there are any questions, I'll take them later. Thank you, Thank Diane. You. Thank you. I, and now I'd like to introduce the president of JJCPF, who you've already gotten a little sneak peek of, uh, Jamaican Jewish descendant, Joseph DeLeon. Joe recently retired as senior manager from Con Ed New York, and since 2014 has participated in documenting Jamaica's historic cemeteries. You're muted, Joe. Thanks, Diane. Thank you, Rachel. And retirement is great. I highly recommend it. So I'd just like to give a little more context uh, to our not-for-profit Jamaican Jewish Cemeteries Preservation Fund, or JJCPF for short. And I also want to thank our seven-member board who continue to generously volunteer their time and their pocketbooks. So JJCPF was established in 2017 on near completion of the cemetery documentation phase. And as Rachel said, the work she led was to one, document the Jewish cemeteries, Two, bring them to public awareness. Three, preservation and maintenance. And four, to make the cemeteries pub publicly accessible. And given that we're talking about a documentation span of 10 years that created thousands of records, including scaled maps, data forms, gravestone and cemetery photos, language transcriptions and language translations, all which needed to be digitized, cross-referenced, 
and load it into a searchable database that we didn't even have yet. The task was large and without funding. Additionally, the physical cemeteries are in need of care if they're to be there for posterity. So a number of core volunteers, including all the speakers here today, created and registered JJCPF in the United States because we thought that's where it would be best to accomplish tax exempt fundraising. We also work in close concert with the leadership and community of the United Congregation of Israelites and enjoy an excellent relationship there. The current joint projects we have with UCI are in various stages and include preparing the records for the cemetery database, as Diane showed, we have 12 more cemeteries, uh, Jewish cemeteries to go. A nameplate project at the Orange Street Cemetery, which you'll hear about soon from Douglas. And we hope to identify the unmarked graves at Hunts Bay Cemetery uh, by commissioning a project using non-intrusive technologies, and I'll talk about that more shortly, and Mary will expand on the use of ground penetrating radar as it relates to Hunts Bay in, in a bit. And lastly, creation of a preservation plan specific to each cemetery. And you can find out more about JJCPF at our website at www.jjcpf.org. So next I'd like to take you to the oldest denominational cemetery in Jamaica, the Jewish cemetery called Hunts Bay, established in the mid 1600s. So I'll launch that from our website. Share my screen. Okay. Your website? Yep. Yep. Well, oh, and from the projects, cemetery database, Hunts Bay. And search records, and I'm doing this. Diane showed this also, but I'm doing, I'm clicking on things that, in, in a way differently than she did. She used gravesite lookup here. I'm clicking on search records, so there are multiple ways to get to the uh, same place. All, all roads lead to um, Rome or Hunts Bay, as it may be. <laughs> um, so, uh, from the top level page, you can see an aerial view of the Hunts Bay Cemetery and the individual grave markers. And what's immediately noticeable uh, that you wouldn't get from just textual information is all the unused space. And it raises an important question. Is it really unused space or are there burials there without markers? And we're confident that there are. We know of 350 burials, but the true number is certainly higher because the grave markers were not made locally. And families who couldn't afford to have gravestones made abroad and shipped to Jamaica would use other materials like wood markers or seashells to outline their graves. And Mary will show some examples of how um, these are lost over time. So to get a more accurate count, we're hoping to raise sufficient funds to commission the use of non-intrusive technologies to locate the unmarked graves. We've assembled a team that includes archaeologists and scientists and have been having discussions about the methodology and technologies to use. Once we locate the unmarked graves, the historical record can then importantly be updated and will document and mark the newly learned burials to give the deceased a posthumous sense of dignity and belonging. And I'd like to give some credit to Bruce Kahan, who was instrumental in getting this team together. And Bruce may be with us today. Um, so now I'd like to pivot and show another use case of how, how someone researching family ancestry might use the database. My grandfather's name is Joseph Rodriguez de Leon, and my great great grandfather's name is Joseph Rodriguez de Leon. I could do a search of Doyon, but I'm also of the Rodriguez Doyon line. So what if I wanted to see what was available on that family line? I could enter Rodriguez in the search field. And there I see two entries of my namesakes, um, Jacob and Samuel. And when we upload the Orange Street Cemetery, I would also find my grandfather and my great-great-grandfather in that line. So that would be 350 years of Rodriguez de Leon history, going back to the beginning of recorded Jewish presence in Jamaica and found in a short period of time. So clicking on Jacob's name gives me a wealth of information. I see exactly where his grave is located on a map. So if I were to visit Hunts Bay for the first time, I would know exactly where he's located. And the results pane, as Diane showed, there are multiple pictures of his grave marker which I can flip through. 
click on these and download and I'll choose this one. Um, and you can see his grade marker? Yes. Great. Okay. So I see his markers are doing with three languages, Hebrew in the middle, Spanish down below, and English around the perimeter. And if I can't read Hebrew or Spanish, I can go to the document section and learn what it says by reading the... Um, I go down to the document section and read the um, translations. So this is Spanish to English, uh, thanks to Judith Berlowitz. There's the um, Hebrew translation and transcription, thanks to uh, Sam Petikowski. Um, and I'm not going to read it, but it, it's a really beautiful poem. Um, so, so additionally, um, if I didn't, if I didn't um, speak, could interpret those, I'd have to find somebody who could interpret those languages for me if I couldn't speak them. And having gone through wills and other documents, they're not modern Spanish or everyday prose, so I'd need someone acquainted with old Spanish. Additionally, because the database is owned and controlled by JJCPF and UCI, we can easily update it as more is learned to further enrich it. We could add other documents as they become available, for example, a will, tax record, census, or a photo of the deceased. So it gives many tools for researchers to use, whether it be genealogical, historical, or for preservation efforts. So that's a bit about JJCPF and what we're up to. Thanks for listening and um, turning us back to Rachel now to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Doug Reed. Doug is a seventh generation Jamaican who operates Kingston-based Grosvenor Galleries, an art gallery. Doug serves on the board of the United Congregation of Israelite Synagogue and of JJCPF, which he says is one of his most rewarding activities, discovering and preserving the history of some of the oldest denominational cemeteries in the Western Hemisphere, to quote him. Doug will now take you on a tour of the Orange Street Cemetery. Thanks. And this is another video, so again, if you can adjust your volume up uh, if necessary. Hi, I'm Douglas Reed, one of the JJCPF team. I'm uh, a member of our own synagogue and uh, director of that synagogue, uh, Synagogue Shar Shalom, uh, run by the United Congregation of Israelites. We're here at Orange Street Cemetery, so named because it's on Orange Street, very noisy, busy street, as you hear. You'll see later in contributions from others by Rachel and others, aerial views of this. It's a three acre cemetery. Um, it's the youngest Jewish cemetery in Jamaica, youngest of many cemeteries and burial plots, uh, numbering in excess of 30, but it's the only one still in use. Um, I am a Jamaican, I was born here. I have, my mother is of blessed memory is very here. Both of her parents and grandparents all right here at Orange Street. Uh, Orange Street was first uh, commissioned to be used 200 years ago. Actually, it is the coming up to the, bi the bicentenary because it was first commissioned in 1822 and it would have been started, you know, typically in the Northwestern corner, or what is typical of, of, of cemeteries and their layout. Um, of course, in 200 years, many, many graves and plots now find themselves with no marker at all. So the JJCPF, in conjunction with the UCI, currently have a project to rename or to make nameplates to, um, you know, correct the, uh, the anonymity of many of these lots. 
Our nameplate project has been uh, on the go for some time, a couple of years. I mean, obviously to rename graves with, that currently have no markers is quite a technical operation because one has to find out with a high degree of certainty um, exactly who is here and therefore what name to put. So, you know, this is a typical site of a plot that is currently nameless. There are many others. And then all the research was done using our oil cloth and the synagogue register to find plot numbers, row numbers, names, dates, and all the technical and correct information. And with that information, we chose in the first instance, a few dozen uh, sites with um, that needed names, and came up with a design using a tasteful, you know, neutrally colored marble to put the name back on, uh, to which we would then affix to uh, locations that were nameless, having first ensured that we were dealing with the correct name, etc. We did a few dozen of these and we are on to the second phase. Uh, we've actually increased our scope now because we are now including date of birth and date of death. So, so we've increased the scope of the project as it were, including additional information. Uh, again, with all the laborious technical aspect of it, and, and the project has taken a while with the resources that we have. Um, it will be an ongoing project and we'll do as many as we can. This is uh, one of the earlier set installed. You know, there are a lot of questions of aesthetics and the right way of doing it and in conservator, you know, being conservatorily sound and, and, and doing the least additional damage. Uh, so that's it. Um, this is this is um, this is actually where we started in, in this corner. Uh, again, that's just the name of. And unfortunately, many, 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 many sites are nameless. And hopefully, we will get to all of them if we can increase the scope of the project and get others on board. Technical, technically, with the technical competence, with the resources, and with the funding that is necessary, it would be wonderful to complete this and do every single unmarked grave. Thank you, thank you so much, Doug, and thanks, Joe. Um, lastly, I'm going to introduce my close colleague, Mary Jablonski. Mary is senior architectural conservator and founder and president of Jablonski Building Conservation Inc., based here in New York City. She's worked on everything from skyscrapers to clearly historic cemeteries. And in addition to being a JJCPF board member, helps document and preserve Jamaica's Jewish cemeteries. Thanks, Mary. Mary, I'm here. Sorry, um, thank you for everyone for hanging in here. Um, we'll be going through this fairly quickly. But um, I called this where have all the grave markers gone? Because when we think of cemeteries, we think of marked graves such as we see here in the Falmouth. Sorry, this is not moving. Sorry, right, there we go. Um, the marked graves we see in the Falmouth Cemetery in Jamaica. Uh, these are called tabletop markers. Please note the conch shells on top of these markers because I'm going to be mentioning that shortly. Uh, okay. but carefully look at cemeteries and we often see open spaces. Spaces with no visible evidence of markers left such as this Orange Street Cemetery um, in Kingston, Jamaica. Now, what can happen is the markers could be, sorry, damaged or stolen. But more frequently, the, these empty spaces were not marked with traditional markers, but something that was a more affordable material. And here we can see conch shells that were outlining this grave. 
Now, remember the shells that were placed on the grave in Falmouth. Obviously, or probably when that cemetery was cleaned, it was not understood that those shells were actually marking the grave. And these more ephemeral materials, as we saw, are easily lost. Here we can see that there are only six shells left. It's just so easy to clean a cemetery a cemetery up in the various plots and you lose them. Now, this is the Falmouth, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Hunts Bay Cemetery that we've been discussing. And you can see that it is actually fill, whoops, filled with empty spaces. My apologies, but the up and down key is not working. So the question is, you know, it's very typical for historic cemeteries. But nobody knows often in these historic cemeteries how many people were buried or where they were buried. And so the question then comes, you know, how do you find these people? Well, this was something actually that happened when um, at the Rossville American Methodist Zion, sorry, the Rossville American Methodist Episcopal Zion Church Cemetery in Southwest Staten Island, which is actually a part of New York City, though they might not admit it. Um, but the cemetery is considered one of the most significant African-American burial grounds. The area was first settled in the 1830s by African-American oystermen from Chesapeake Bay, fleeing restrictive industry laws in Maryland. And my firm actually produced a cultural landscape report for the cemetery, which included historic documentation, field documentation, and looking at change in historic integrity of the landscape. Now, while many African-Americans are buried without headstones, graves would be marked in various ways and is sometimes known as grave goods. But you rarely see a lot of stone markers and monuments in, in black cemeteries. It was, you know, more ephemeral materials that were used. Now, the cemetery boundaries actually um, were quite well documented in maps. What's interesting is housing developments on either side have actually begun to encroach on those boundaries. What we found when we arrived were at the very few markers, um, mainly open spaces. Oops. Um, but what they did have was this wonderful little um, map uh, that delineated plots and pathways, which was extremely useful. And we took a look at aerial photographs as well that dated from uh, 1924 through 1912, showing sort of a change in the pathways over time. And if you take a look at um, Google Maps, you can again see that these pathways are still somewhat visible here. This is the overground and empty spaces that we started with. Um, and, but we wanted to know, was there any way to find where any of these graves could be? And the answer is actually, there is an answer. Um, and it's archeological geophysics. This is the examination of the Earth's physical properties using non-invasive ground penetrating um, uh, detection methods. It can detect subterranean features, fairly precisely map them, um, and it suggests interpretation with context, form, and distribution. Now, I should state there's a whole variety of methods that can be used. Given the nature of this, um, what we expected to find, the environmental conditions, and even the soil, it was decided that um, high resolution ground penetrating radar was probably the best method to use. And that's what you see in this image, though this is not the Rossville Cemetery. And it, the ground conditions were ideal for this. Um, what was a little problematic was the plantings, the railings, and we ended up having to survey in shorter segments than we ever intended. Weather conditions actually were also quite good for the kind of information. So what we ended up with was, um, this is the map of the findings of the ground penetrating radar. Um, it allowed for the identification of 573 probable and possible burials five times more than what was found. The trees, dense vegetation, and other obstacles um, allowed us only to survey about 80% of the cemetery. And the uninvestigated areas are the ones that you can see in the green hatching there. 
But overall, we think that this is actually pretty accurate. And when we overlaid it on the uh, plot map that we had there, you can see that it actually fits quite well and is probably ac as accurate as you could possibly get. Now, at present, we're looking into, a, as you heard from Joe, a variety of the archaeological geophysical techniques for Hunts Bay. It's been difficult with COVID to go visit the site and do any kind of soil analysis. We're working on it. We hope to be able to identify a technique and find the funding, in case anybody's interested, for doing some of this work soon. So while we'll never be able to recover the actual grave markers, we will hopefully know where these graves are going to be found. Oops. And thank you very much for listening and hanging in there. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And that. Um... That concludes our presentation and we'd be happy to take questions. Well, let's start with the question that's here. Okay. First of all, thank you very much. That's true. Thank you, Professor Perellis. Thank you. Uh, that is very true. Uh, that was, yes, <laughs> people were writing throughout like, this is exciting. This is interesting. Can we have a recording? Because there are people that need to see this. Um, so, And thank you to those who answered uh, during um, so first, I just want to read off the first question. Mm -hmm. If the general practice was not to expand a cemetery, were there two different purchasers, how they got, got around it? I'm not sure. Yeah, let, just... let me just be clear. So I think uh, this is referencing what we call the Orange Street Cemetery. So the first, uh, the lower half of that cemetery, as you saw it in the in the uh, drone image, was purchased by, KK, by, by the um, Spanish Portuguese congregation. And then the new congregation, which merged some members of the Spanish Portuguese and some members of the English German, purchased a second cemetery adjacent to it. And then when those two congregations merged, most of that wall came. I cannot tell you um halachically the story of whatever halachic discussions went into that but um the cemetery wasn't really enlarged um per se i, I hope i was clear in that regard it was not enlarged uh the congregations merged so the two separate cemeteries sort of became one Okay, and I do want to make note that I'm inviting everybody now to please open your cameras. Please do accept being a panelist. That doesn't mean that you need to speak. That just means that we'd like to see your beautiful face. So if you wouldn't mind opening. Um, I do see that Carolyn has a question. So let's see if she can come in. Ronnie, did you want to say something or? No, you're on mute. You're on mute, Ronnie. Sorry, I have a lot of questions, but I see already there's some hands raised. So maybe we should go to, uh, I mean, I think I see, this was Karen wonderful, thank you. Uh, I see Gary Robinson has a question. Oh, I missed that. Gary? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, kudos to all the work being done on the documentation of all these cemeteries. My question is, given it's the JJCPF, not DF, Preservation Fund, not Documentation Fund, can anybody talk about the plans for preservation for the future? Mary, Joe, do you wanna address that or anybody else? Make sure you take yourself off mute. Yeah, sorry, I think that the, the the issue is we are still continuing the documentation. You can't preserve anything unless you understand what it is you exactly have. And that's the issue here. Um, for instance, you know, we're looking at Hunts Bay, which is the oldest cemetery, but we do not know exactly what we have. So we are going on to the next level of documentation. We've documented what's visible. So now the thing is to identify boundaries and to identify what is invisible. Yeah, thanks. And, and Gary, um, as you know, this, um, given your involvement with Lucy, the, uh, this is not, uh, you know, this moves kind of slowly, right? And um, right now, uh, we're focused on, on Hunts Bay, the projects we have in flight, Hunts Bay, uh, the, na the nameplate um, project, and one of our charters 
will be to, to create a preservation plan for each uh, each cemetery. So that is on our that is on our charter. And as as Mary said, can't do anything until you get the documentation done. So we're really focused on getting the remaining twelve cemeteries loaded into um, into Semify, right? And that's 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 mainly what's in front of us uh, now. Um, but uh, a preservation plan for each cemetery uh, is is on our charter. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, um, I'm and so so interested in what I've been seeing on this. It is so totally different from my own experiences in Jamaica. Um, I visited a couple of times in the 1970s on on vacations. And those who know me, I taught for 37 and a half years at, as a social studies teacher in New York City. And um, I had a lot of students from the Caribbean. I taught Caribbean history. Jamaica was like the hardest place I was in the Caribbean to find history. I, my first trip, I was in the North. A taxi drivers couldn't figure out how to get to Kingston. They could only take you to shopping centers. It was called tourist reserves. I got absolutely nothing out of it that I would have wanted to. And I really don't like beaches. The second time I stumbled into something, I was in, on the QE2 and we stopped in Port Antonio. And I stumbled into the school book depository and found a ton of books on history that I used in the classroom, particularly in comparing slavery with the United States and, and Jamaica. It was like a gold mine there. So it seems that there's so much more openness in doing historical research and in um, spreading the information about this historical research. And I'm curious about the historiography, uh, the history of historiography in this field and your communication with people who want to visit Jamaica and learn about the real history of Jamaica. So can you tell me something about um, how uh, you and other people have been working to uh, make the history of Jamaica available to people that want to visit, not to see the beaches, but to see Jamaica? Um, Marina, is that a question for you? Or is that, who's that a question for? What do you think? Yeah, I can, I can answer a bit on that, Rachel. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carolyn. Well, <laughs> It's individual people that seem to, you know, that are really passionate about history that try to do something small. I mean, we have historical organizations in Jamaica. Um, for me as one, I did my master's in um, heritage management in London, and I came back home and it took me a few years to um, establish a walking tour, a heritage walking tour in Falmouth, where that Jewish cemetery is located. Um, but in my walking tour, I would give a history, a generalized history of Jamaica and of Falmouth, which is, you know, one of, was one of the best preserved Georgian towns in the Caribbean. And then for those who are interested and knew about the Jewish cemetery, I would give that history as it's, as it's a history that is marginalized in our general narrative here in Jamaica. But there are, you know, there are more of us now that are able to share Jamaica's history. It's maybe not as easy to find because history is just not as important for some people. You know, they prefer the sand, sea, and sun still. I'm not sure if that helps to answer yeah. your question. Yeah, uh, can, do you have a chronology of when, when this, this attempt to um, teach about Jamaica, really about Jamaica, has been going on. Certainly, it wasn't there in the 1970s. Uh, you mentioned uh, 20, 2014 as um, the beginning research on the on the cemeteries. Um, uh, you know, I think if you take when a look, this, if you take a yeah. look at the JJCPF website, mm -hmm. um, you might find some some of the history of our work there, which I think is what you're. I yeah, what you're asking. Yeah, and yeah. I'll resend the I'll re resend the uh, email. The sorry, the website in an email tomorrow. And Mr. Gobai, you had a question. Uh, yes. Oh, you're muted. Yep, you muted yourself now. How about now? Right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. First of all, incredible um, job. Thank you. Um, I have a long history with Jamaica, and I and I see Ainsley here. So I just have to say hi to him. He's the great Ainsley. 
Um, uh, and others here, all of you. Um, so years ago, I came, I went to Montego Bay um, and to Lucy. And several times I have done this. So I, I, I know others have done it also, where I go and I, I hire individuals from the area. I clean up the area. I try to paint um, the graffiti over and we do, uh, and uh, we clean up both in Lucy, I clean up uh, with my helpers um, in Lucy and in Montego Bay. I've seen the deterioration, unfortunately, of Montego Bay from, I don't know, 12, 15 stones to less and less stones every year. And, but Lucy, Lucy is a, a very interesting cemetery. I just wanna point that out. Mr. Hart, the attorney in the center, those who understand the history of this right next to the woman's prison, it's an incredible um, history and heritage and all that. And I encourage all of us to continue with this thing and certainly to contribute in time and efforts. And I've gone there with glue guns and things of that nature and tried my best. Uh, and I've been to Orange Street with Ainsley. But my question to you is this. For years and years, I have heard about a cemetery in Maroon territory. And I've asked about yeah. it. And I even asked Ainsley who said he didn't know about it. But just recently I have heard that the one cemetery in Maroon territory, which apparently has some Hebrew writing on it, which is interesting because it would, in, it, it would involve someone going all the way up there who knew Hebrew and, and was lost to the jungle that it was found again, which and it was my going to be my expedition in my retirement sooner or later to go and find that one. OK, with the rest of my army buddies from the Israeli army. And we were all going to go out there and find that that cemetery. Has anybody heard that it was found? And uh, if you would, somehow you can get my email address from Professor Ronnie Perellis and uh, and uh, and send me some info, because this has been an a part of my life history fantasy as it involves the Jamaican cemeteries. Marina is muted, but if yeah. she doesn't know about it, I wouldn't know who would. Really? Marina says, mean, which, which maroon territory though? There's several. I know. I, I just <laughs> heard it's there. It, it's been found. Okay. <laughs> okay. Keep an eye out for it. Keep an eye we out for it. Keep an eye out for it for sure. Uh, thank you. And Diane, did you want to say one more thing before we? Your hand is up. Yes. Mr. Gabay, are yes. you a Gabay? That is a name we see on many graves in the Jewish cemeteries in Jamaica. Are you a descendant? I'm sure I am. I'll tell you why. Oh. The oldest Jewish uh, tombstone in Jamaica is Abraham Gabay. And three Gabay brothers showed up. They were Portuguese. My family comes from Portugal and, and there was a split off. And in fact, my great aunt, unfortunately, who has Alzheimer's now, and she wrote a book about the family. She said, you know, the family Galut, Galut, the diaspora of Portugal went and ended up in Jamaica. And I didn't know this fact until like two years ago, but wow. I had it in my heart. The first time I landed, they said to me, the lady at the uh, counter said to me, Gabe, Gabe, this is like 25, 20 some years ago. She said, Gabe, you know, they live up the street from me. I said, uh, are you related? I said, who? She said, the Gabe's, the noisy people up the street. I said, the noisy, <laughs> I'm related. Well, I feel an affinity. That. I don't need a DNA test. <laughs> thank you for that. We'll see you in Jamaica. Amen. I know we went over, but I feel like we have to, Ainsley has his hand up and I feel like, we have to. So Ainsley, did you have something to say? Like to oh, no, you're on mute. Say, oh, I'd okay. like to be able to welcome all my friends. Most of them have either lost their hair or grown gray beard. So anyway, welcome to all of you. <laughs> hey, hey, Ronnie, you can drive, you can try. The, 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 the Gabe story is an interesting story. And I grew up with Gabe's at the Sugar Estate where I come from, near where I came from. But the point I really wanted to make is that I've been fairly close to the more town maroons over many years, and they did have a strong relationship in their historical fight with the English in the 17th, 18th, early 18th century. And they recognized that Jews were particularly important 
in that particular exercise. So there may be a cemetery or cemetery or, or a Jew or a couple of Jews who are buried in that area. And now, now you put me onto the case. I'm going to speak to Colonel Sterling, but this is the more tall Maroons as opposed to the other Maroon community. And it's likely that if there's anybody there, this is the first Maroon settlement that actually had a relationship, uh, an early relationship with the fight with the British. So that's a good start to that. Um, I think that, you know, the work that is being done by the JCPF is important, but there's some other work that has to be acted on in terms of creating the records. And uh, I could volunteer a number of families, most of the Jewish families in Jamaica could help you with the records of their births, deaths and marriages over the generations from the beginning of the records and even in fact before. That's been one of my missions since I ever discovered uh, the business of uh, recording families, this family histories. And uh, you know, most of you will have heard something of it from me, but I do not necessarily want to share anybody's information publicly and uh, reasons for that. Um, I do not need to discuss them that now. But the other very important thing is that the preservation concept, I think, has to uh, look at the business of a nomenclature, because the restoration and preservation and, and restoration of the, of, 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 of the cemetery is one thing, but the maintenance is critical, absolutely critical. Oh, um, just, just give my wife the phone to answer. Uh, I, and I think we've been having a conversation, some of us, in the last few days, that we do have to change the way that we are looking at maintaining our cemetery and add to that the resonance of what has been happening with the preservation concept. So I leave that open for further conversation. But Thank good you. Luck. Thank Keep you, going. Ainsley. Ra Ronnie, I'd love to hear your questions. I, so I have, a, I mean, I have a, a lot of, it is late, but I'll, I'll throw out a few and they're related. So That's one right. of my questions that was, I was really struck by one of the scenes when um, I forget in which video it was, I think it was in, in Falls Mouth, um, uh, where, where you interviewed the caretakers. And I thought that was so wonderful and, and to hear from them, their perspective and the tour guide. So I'm really curious. I remember when I was in Jamaica for the wonderful conference that uh, Ainsley and Jane Gerber and Stan Mervis um, put together. Um, and we went, we visited one of the cemeteries and it's, you know, it's surrounded by a very, very poor neighborhood. I mean, this is tough. This is a really, as in, as is most of Kingston, right? I mean, there's a lot of poverty surrounding these areas. How do the people around look at it? Do they see this as part of their patrimony? Do they see this as like a bunch of, you know, privileged people from the outside who come in and have all these, you know, I'm just thinking about these issues of race and equity and how does that filter factor into these issues? So I think there's, if you study, Jews in, Jews in the Caribbean, as I have, I've been fortunate enough to, to, to work on this, you can't avoid the questions of race and class and, and, and status and all those things. So I'm curious about that. It's a huge question. Don't have to answer it, but I'm just putting it out there. And the other question is that maybe more fundamental, which is why do it? I mean, I'm so inspired and I'm so fascinated, but I still have this question. I mean, everyone's gonna have their own reason why they do it, but what would you tell people? Why is this important? Um, work. And there's obviously there's things just you hear the story, it's compelling. But but what 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 is it? What are what are we what are you trying to do? Um, and again, it's a big panel, so I don't know who wants to take any of the questions. Those are my those are the two of the things that really were coming up for me a lot during the, the this really um, you know rich and and uh, and and provocative uh, presentation. I'd like um, Marina to answer that for two yeah. reasons. One is she can talk about your, she can address your first question best. And, and, and maybe Doug too, since they're both in Jamaica. Yeah. And then I'd like Marina also to talk about the second part of your question because it ties in with the state of archives in Jamaica mm -hmm. and what is not there and can only be found in the cemeteries. Right, right, right. So Doug right. and Marina. Yeah, so Ronnie, um, I'll start with why I do it. Um, when I was 
So I'm 57 now. So 20 years ago, approximately 22 years ago, I realized there was a, you know, you, you heard Jewish names in Jamaica, but I did not realize there was an active community. And I'm saying to myself, and I love history. And I said to myself, why has this not been told? Why is this not taught in our schools? Why do we not know of this? And that started me on just reading certain books, you know, whether it's novels, things on Judaism, you know, it, it, things that just got me interested. And um, I applied to do my master's in London and um, I decided I wanted to do, I was looking for something to do with heritage management uh, because the Ministry of Tourism had set out a paper, a master plan that they were going to establish a, a heritage unit. So I got through at age 39, I'm gonna go and do my masters. I, when I got there, I cried for a week in London. I said, what have I done? You know, I've used up all my savings and I don't know, I don't even know how to use a library. So, but, and then it got to the point two months into it, like, what is your math? What is your thesis gonna be on? I said, well, there's two things I'm interested in. I can't remember the first thing, but the other thing I said, I've always been interested in cemeteries and I'm interested in Jewish cemeteries. So they said, go and speak to David. Um, what is David's last name again? But um, he was, he worked at London. He was a professor at London Metropolitan University. Did a lot of, um, um, I think he did his PhD on Italian synagogues and stuff in the, when he was nearly 60. Um, but he was excellent as, a, as my non-official supervisor. So I, be, I actually, this is when I met Ainsley, introduced myself and worked, and Ainsley was working on the, um, the museum at um, establishing it. And that's what I did my, my master's thesis on. But um, it, to go back to your first question and how people feel in the area. In Falmouth, I don't get any negative feelings about it. Um, it's located by a, a one, one of the neighbors is a decent family that have been there forever. Some people know, yes, they know that it was a, it, it's a Jewish cemetery, but nothing against it. I've had, I've put up some signs before, just temporary signs, like just uh, um, on the gate and it has been torn off, but no graffiti. Um, someone jumps over the fence every now and then to pick the the ackies off the tree, you know. But otherwise, the the care the person that does the cutting for me, he's born and grown in Falmouth. They, he's respected around the area, and no one will question him for looking after that, you know. Um, and the tour guide too, she's an excellent tour guide and everything fascinates her. So when she learned about the cemetery and was learning about it, it's, it's always a moving experience for her as for the people that we have there. So I hope that's kind of yeah. answered that for you. Maybe Doug want to an wants to answer why he does it, yeah. you know? Doug, can you also talk a little bit about Kingston and make sure you're not muted? Sure. Um, <laughs> Pose a question again. What am I sharing, answering? Was it from you, Ronnie? Yeah. What? Why do you do this? What's driving? What's What's the reason to do this? And, and also, what is the? How is the Jewish cemetery, Orange Street, very prominent across from the major uh, firehouse? How is How is the cemetery? It's three acres. What do Kingstonians think of it? I think that was part of your question. Yeah. What is the, What are the locals? How do the locals view? not only the existence of the cemetery, but the fact that there's people paying so much attention to this, to a cemetery when the life around it is, you know, could use some help as well. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, firstly, I was born here. Um, so my, my interest is largely very practical. Mm -hmm. um, I've attended, I think there's going to be a funeral tomorrow at Orange Street. Um, as I shared in my clip, it is a functional, um, active uh, use. It. You know, I buried my mom there. So, 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 so this is living less, thing. It's a living, it's a living place. Academic, right? This is less academic to me and more my life. So, so, yeah. so, um, it's a question of necessity and a question of practicality for me. 
it isn't just academic. No, I can see the academia. I can I can see the scholarly um, interest and the historic, and it goes back. And I've been to Hunts Bay, and I mean, this is all a big learning curve for me too. I mean, there are many of the Jamaican cemeteries I've never been to. Um, so I am becoming more and more involved, but doing so largely out of necessity. I am an active member of the congregation of the synagogue. So there is less of a disconnect. There, there, there's much more of a connection for me. Um, you know, it's a terrible pity that so much history is being lost. So I would hope to be able to preserve as much of it as possible. You know, that even goes back to a question asked by Gary earlier. And when are we going to start to preserve and, and not just document? But preservation begins with even keeping it clean, maintaining it, you know, even removing graffiti because that preserves it in its intended state and it prevents it prevents us losing it and, and prevents it deteriorating further. There's a lot of deterioration. I mean, there were there have been many years that I haven't been as active. So, you know, there's a lot of catching up to do. There's a lot of, with regard to your original question and how locals around the cemetery, um, I, I don't know that there's that much activity and that it's that much of an issue really. I mean, remember this is, I mean, I'm sure it's a curiosity. I mean, perhaps a mild curiosity. I don't think it's beyond that, though. And I mean, on another side of us, there might be another neighbor doing something else. Who knows what? So I, I, I don't know that it's a huge focus and a huge issue. Um, I don't believe that it is. It's, it's, again, quite incidental, and we just happen to be there. Um, I mean, I believe Falmouth has a neighboring cemetery of a Christian denomination. These are just circumstantial facts. It is what it is. Um, there are other cemeteries throughout the island that may be completely forgotten in worse disrepair, maybe with no neighbors at all. You know, they're, they're forgotten and rediscovered many times over. I, I know Hunts Bay had been forgotten and, and was somewhat rediscovered by a previous rabbi, Silverman. So that's unfortunately the story of us here in Jamaica, Jamaican Jews, our many cemeteries, and with many dozens of cemeteries and with a very small number of us now, it tells you a lot about the history, but we're a small fraction of the numbers of Jews that once, and with the cemeteries ringing the island, as Rachel said and described, literally dotted around the north and south coast, the entirety, I mean, there are just zero Jews there now. So not totally zero. There are some in Negril, there are some in Montego Bay, but Black River and, and um, Alligator Pond. And I, I can't imagine the closest related. Ainsley would be better at this, uh, giving you these facts, but it's, there's a big disconnect. There's a big, um, but me, I'm still connected somehow. So I'm happy about that. It's an honor to be involved. Uh, it's lovely meeting you all. It's lovely that you're interested. And this will grow and we'll, we'll, we'll do better. We'll get more done. We'll, um, you know, have more support and the numbers will grow and, and we'll each share our histories and learn from each other. And, 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 you know, hopefully that will be a positive thing. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wow. Well, I, I, I clearly we could go on. So I think maybe we'll do a part two sometime in the, in the fall or spring. Uh, so, um, yeah, this was this was really informative and wonderful, and got everybody thinking about sunnier places, I guess, all, as well. Um, and I think it definitely built up a desire to to go. Uh, in the meantime, I do want to remind everybody that we have two programs next week. We have uh, the Baghdadi Jews in Asia with uh, Dr. Sasha Goldstein Sabah on Tuesday at noon Eastern time, and we have uh, New Works Wednesday. Actually, it's a young adult novel at this point, and it is on uh, call on the pirates in the same region. So <laughs> we look forward to seeing everybody there uh, uh, next week, and we look forward to seeing everybody in future events. Thank you all for coming once again, and thank you to all of our presenters. It really made it so much better to have all these different viewpoints. So thank you. 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 Thank you.